Hello! Today we are going to do a flight in the Cessna C172 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. This is the version of the Cessna with the G1000, the Garmin G1000 autopilot and flight management computer. So we're going to program a flight into it by hand in the cockpit and then fly that route and have a look at the various instrumentation and modes of the autopilot along the way. Hopefully this will be useful to somebody. As you can see, the weather here is atrocious, so let's go and have a look in Little Nav Map and see where we are. We are at Reading Municipal Airport in California, Northern California. And we're going to fly down via a VOR station called Red Bluff to Chico Municipal, a bit further down, a bit further to the south of us. So it's about a 50 mile route. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll play with VOR stations, we'll play with navigating by GPS, and then we'll land via ILS at Chico Municipal. So the weather is pretty spectacular, which is actually plays into our hands for doing this instrument flight. I'm just looking at the, the wind speed isn't too bad at ground level, it could kind of, might be quite hairy higher up, but we'll have a look and we'll see how we go. Okay, so inside the aircraft, the first thing we need to do is go and turn on the battery and the avionics. You can see the system will boot up and you can hear a warning going on at the moment. So it's just complaining basically about oil pressure, low voltage and vacuum. That's because the engine isn't running. So if we click the soft key underneath the warning, it stops complaining. Over on the secondary screen of the Garmin, you can see click rightmost soft key to continue, which will switch the map on. So there we are next to the airfield. Um, just having, okay. And you can hear enunciations of the system testing itself. If we use the range here, we can zoom in and out of the map. So that's all pretty self-explanatory. We actually want to go and program a flight plan. So you can do that via the FPL button. You'll notice if you click it on the primary screen, it's quite small. If you click it on the secondary screen, it's a lot bigger, so it's easier to see. So I'm just going to click on the stalk of the yoke to make it disappear, so we can see the, the panel much more easily. So to begin programming a flight plan, you press the knob for the FMS, and you will see a flashing cursor appears inside the flight plan box. So then the right, oh sorry, the, the inside dial of the knob is each character and the, the outside knob is your position as you're entering characters. So we want to go to KRDD, Kilo Romeo Delta Delta. So inside knob to select characters, so Kilo then outside knob for the next character, Romeo Delta Delta. I don't know if you've noticed this if you've played around with programming flights in Flight Simulator. It doesn't always filter the letters, which it should. Um, Kilo Romeo Delta Delta and then press enter. And that will add it to the flight plan. There it goes. So then we're going to Red Bluff RBL. So we roll the inside one and carry on to R. Then the next character using the outside ring. It's RBL, R Romeo Bravo Lima. So Bravo and Lima. And press enter. So we now got a magenta line appearing that tells us that is this is our current leg. It knows we are at Kilo Romeo Delta Delta. And our destination airport is Chico Municipal, Kilo, Charlie, India, Charlie. So Kilo. Charlie. India. Charlie. Chico Municipal and press enter. So there we go, there's our flight plan done. 
we can actually go and set altitudes for each waypoint. We're not going to bother with that because we're going to be messing around with the aircraft along the way anyway, using selected altitudes and vertical speeds to get to them. Okay, so once you've done that, you can press the middle of the knob again, it removes the cursor, and you can press the flight plan button, and you can see it's already drawn on the map. If we were to zoom out to increase the range of the map display, you will see there's our entire route. So we'll zoom in a little bit. Okay, so next thing, we're just going to get the aircraft running first before we do anything else. So in the Cessna, you've got, if you look out of the window of a Cessna, you'll see the fuel is actually in the wings. So it's gravity fed down into the engine. So you can leave the fuel selector in the middle. You don't have to select left or right. The fuel shutoff, you, you pull for off on the fuel shutoff valve. So we wouldn't be able to start the engine if this was pulled out. It's pushed in by default when you launch the simulator for some reason. Normally it would be out. Um, so that's the fuel done. And then we should be able to go and start the engine. We've got the mixture here. That's in by default. It's rich by default. You would half expect that to be lean by default. But there you go. So if we go and turn the key. And we can hear the engine, which is great. So now we have the engine running, we can go and turn some lights on. So we want the beacon light, the taxi light, the nav light and the strobe light. We'll also turn on the pitot heat. So if we look out the window again, there's a tube here with a sensor in it that's going to measure our indicated airspeed. If that gets frozen up, which could happen in cold clouds, then the indicated airspeed would go completely up the wall because it wouldn't have any reading from outside if it gets blocked up with ice. Okay. So let's go and taxi round and take off and then we can start playing with all of this instrument instrumentation and explain what it is and what it does. Before we do take off, let's just have a quick look. So we've got the nav radio frequencies up in the top left corner. You've got the leg that you're flying of the flight plan directly above the, the screen. You've got the distance to the next waypoint and the bearing of that next waypoint from where you are. You've got the comm radio frequencies at the top right. You've got altitude. You've got vertical speed alongside the altitude. Obviously, it's not showing anything at the moment. You've got target altitude at the top of the altitude ribbon. So if you set an altitude you're going to climb out to, we can actually do that. So if we go and say um, we've got the altitude knob is down here. So we've got thousands and hundreds on the two dials. So if I go and roll the outer dial, we can go for 3,000 feet. And then we can press the vertical speed button saying we're going to go to vertical speed mode and we can press nose up once per 100 feet that you want to climb so say we went for 5000 feet that's uh, sorry 500 feet per minute until we get to 3000 feet okay so we can leave that as it is and let's go and release the wheel brakes if we have actually look below to see how we did that. So when this is pulled out, the wheel brakes are on. When it's just pushed in, they're off. So if you notice what the pedals are doing in a Cessna, you actually tip the pedals to apply the brakes. So releasing them is not tipping the pedals anymore. OK, so we're going to do a sharp right turn. So we can open the throttle gently. and we're rolling. Probably just took the head off of the guy with the, the tow truck or the tug. We can press space to sit up in our seat to see where we're going. And we're going to taxi round. We're not using ATC today because it would just be a distraction from me talking. So this should be fairly straightforward. So we, we'll get the aircraft straight. I think we can see a little bit of icing happening on the windscreen. Or is it just rain? No, it's just rain. So we're going to go and centre ourselves up on the runway. Okay, 
So we are going to control the aircraft manually down the runway as soon as we take off sort of within a few hundred feet of the ground we will engage the autopilot at which point it will stop us rolling because it's in roll mode and which is its default mode and it will apply vertical speed at 500 feet a minute to get us to 3000 feet so let's see that happen so full throttle release the wheel brakes So we're watching the indicated airspeed, we're dropping flaps to one. The wind is pushing us all over the place. And we've got quite a strong headwind look. We've, we've taken off at 60 knots, or thereabouts. So flaps up. And engage the autopilot. So I've let go of the stick. So you can now see Autopilot is on, we're in roll mode, vertical speed is 500 feet a minute until we get to 3000 feet. So you can see that reflected here, the actual vertical speed is 500 feet a minute. So the plane is flying itself, notice it is already deviating from the runway direction beneath us, that's the wind pushing us. If we want to see the wind, just briefly, on the PFD, which is primary flight display options, we can show the wind. So we could say option 3, so we've got a 15 knot headwind. Well, they're about 14 knot, coming straight into our face, basically. So we're going to let the plane climb out. And you will notice on the map we've got a route, and we, we're only in roll mode on the autopilot at the moment. So if we want to actually follow our GPS route, we need to make sure that if we go back, so you can see the symbology for this, we need to make sure that the CDI, or Course Deviation Indicator, is in the right mode. So if we click the button underneath it, it's, in, it's now in GPS mode. So you can cycle through VOR1, VOR2 and GPS. So GPS means it will follow our programmed flight plan. So if I now press the nav button, it says GPS up here. So the plane is going to track back to the plan. So you can see where we were slightly off the plan. If we look on little nav map, you can see it happening. It's actually making its way back to the line. Okay, so along the way, we're going to have a look at using nav mode on the GPS. We're also going to play with the VORs. So let's go and program nav one to go to 115.70. So at the moment, we've got nav one on 113.90. We want to change it so we can use the outer ring for the integers so we can go to 115 sorry it's on 110.50 at the moment and this is the standby frequency with that we can program we want 115.70 so the inner ring is the the decimals so 115.70 when we press this arrow button it becomes the active frequency that the system is using which has done nothing because the CDI or course deviation indicator is in GPS mode which is what the, the autopilot is following. The autopilot will follow, if you're in nav mode, it will follow whichever mode the CDI is in. So if we then change the CDI to VOR, the plane's going to try to change direction. Yeah? And before we do it, let's go to heading mode. Press the middle of the heading. So we're going to carry on going what route were we going? 156 degrees. So let's move this heading bug using the heading roller to 156 and you can see the integers here more easily. So we're going to get the plane on heading mode on the autopilot to fly 156 and then we can play with what, whatever setting is on the VOR to see what it actually means. So you can, at the moment you can see this green arrow pointing west and that's our course so if we turn this, you can see the course here. Oh, sorry, it's pointing north, not west. It was hidden underneath the arrow. So if I move this roller over here, which is the course setting, I can roll this round. And you can see at the moment, if we roll it round a little bit further,
when the green bar goes into the middle that means that we are going directly towards the VOR station yeah and because we're so close to it that makes sense so we're in heading mode on the autopilot we're going to tell the plane to go left so we'll go 90 degrees on the compass yeah so we're going to turn the heading to deviate so we get to see what happens we'll go for 100 degrees so we're not too far away from the course so the plane is turning left to 100 degrees and you can see that happening outside it's horrific weather isn't it it's a good job we've got the instruments otherwise we wouldn't have a clue where we were so we are now flying 100 degrees across the, the landscape so remember we've got VOR1 tuned into Red Bluff so watch what's happening to this needle it's getting further and further away even if we turn this around using the course if we turn this to say well okay what direction is the the beacon so if we get the line in the middle the arrow is pointing at the beacon yes yeah, so we are on the on the line at 163 degrees to the beacon but because we're traveling across so if you imagine from here we measure that was 168 on, my, on, on this compass anyway or did I read it wrong on there? I must have read it wrong on there anyway you can see we're traveling actually away from that line though so we're now to the left of that line and that's being shown here yeah so we are to the left of the line on the course deviation indicator if we wanted to know the direction to point or to fly directly to the beacon all we need to do is rotate the course until the line is in the middle and that tells us we need to fly a course of 168 degrees so if we then turn our heading to 168 see but it's already too late because we're so close to it but close enough so we could go past that so we could intercept the line so if we went for 180 degrees we'll then be flying 10 degrees or so further across so we'll re-intercept the line so yeah you can see that happening let's go and remove that measurement okay so you can see here that this line comes in at a, a, a a bearing of 156 yeah so if we wanted to fly 156 we can do that on the course I say actually yeah we wanted to fly the 156 line into the VOR so if we now press the nav button in other words the autopilot is now going to try and fly the 156 degree line into VOR station at 115.7 so the plane is automatically going to intercept so because we are using the VOR mode and we're in nav mode which is showing VOR up here it's disregarding the heading now yeah we can roll this heading around all we like it's going to take no notice of it so we've used the course to program the CDI and nav mode is following that so it's going to try and fly a 154 degree track into the VOR station at 115.70 so you can see it's intercepting at the moment while we're flying along let's do a flight level change so should we can increase another thousand feet just to re-show how we do that so we can roll the outer altitude knob and that's changed the target altitude to 4000 to climb to that height we select vertical speed and then we can use the nose up and nose down to change the, hu the, sp the rate at which we get there so I've pressed nose up five times which has given us 500 feet a minute 
and the aircraft is now climbing at 500 feet a minute towards 4,000 feet and you can see the speed dropping as that happens. So hopefully as we get a bit closer to the the beam here, or sorry, not the beam, the, the track, you will see the aircraft turn left to meet it. So you can see it on the map here. So if we change the range, you can see us approaching that slowly. Let's go and have a look outside while we're waiting and see some of this horrific weather. Flight seems very pretty, isn't it? This was a good day to be doing this as an instrument example, I guess. So the plane is following the course marker that we have programmed, or the course we have programmed with the VOR. So we've essentially told it to do exactly the same thing that the GPS route is doing, but we've done it via the VOR. You will notice there is a second green marker here on the arrow. That means that is the bearing to the VOR. If we were to spin this around, which we could do and the aeroplane would jump all over the place when we do it, the, um, that will swap around so then you get the indication that you this is the bearing from the VOR, not to the VOR. Okay, so the plane is getting close so you should see it starting to turn left and it, it will happen very gently so if we just move the heading bug so we can use that as a frame of reference to see when it gets there of course the plane will also account for the wind as we turn so at the moment we know the wind is coming from 171, 39 knots, so it's quite strong winds up here. We've got a hell of a headwind. So we are approaching, you can see the green bar coming in, which means we are approaching the track that we want to be on. So then the plane will turn left towards the track. So while we're flying towards, here we go, we're starting to turn left. So that's the autopilot doing that for us. We're at 4,000 feet now, so it's holding at 4,000 feet. While we're flying along, let's go and have a look at some of the functionality built into the G1000. It's actually quite clever. So this PFD we touched on earlier is the primary flight display options. If we click on that, we get various options across here. We saw wind earlier. You can display wind in three different ways. So you can show the, hor the lateral and, I guess, axial component of the wind, you might describe it. You can show an arrow and a speed, or you can show an arrow and a direction and a speed. Or you can turn the wind off. We'll leave it on direction and speed for the moment. In DME, we can see the distance measuring equipment measuring to the VOR if it's available. So on 115.7 we can see 8.5 miles to go to the VOR station. If you click on bearing, it's showing pretty much the same thing. HSI format, you can change the format of this display entirely. So by, by default it shows you it in 360 HSI mode, that's horizontal situation indicator, so that's the name of this display. So we're seeing all the whole 360 degrees of the compass rows. We can show arc mode, which cuts it in half, and you just see the top half of the compass rows. Yeah, so some people actually prefer that, and for certain situations it's quite a, a useful indicator. But let's go back to 360 HSI, because it's quite a nice way of getting an overview. Um, Bearing 2, that would be for VOR2, so if you wanted to do that, so you can play around with that. Um, I'm going to turn that off and go back. What else could we look at that's useful? On the timer reference page, you get to use a timer, so you can press the FMS 
knob to put the cursor in there and you could set a timer and do what you want with that we're not going to bother today so we can clear out what we can press the button to cancel out there you can also see the glide and rotate speeds for the aircraft you have um, we didn't look at transponder so you only really use the transponder if you're using air traffic control so if you switch it on you might want to go and program the code for your transponder in which case you can program the numbers in so you're, and you can do an ident call to the um, nearest station but we're not going to bother with looking at transponders today um, that's about it really so th there's a ton of stuff that's useful in the PFD menu so we've also mentioned OBS is the omni bearing selector I'm not going to get too much into that today so CDI is the um, course deviation indicator so that's the mode that this is operating in so notice because we've said VOR and GPS are almost the same as each other if we go to nav mode because we were flying the exactly the same track it's not really going to be much different so you can see magnetic the reason that the needle moved is you're looking now at true north versus magnetic so if we go and change the CDI back to VOR you saw the needle move okay so once we get to RBL we'll carry on I'll pause the video after we get to RBL and then uh, reacquire it. I'll show you the navigation we're going to do to get to, what, to the ILS beam but then I may pause recording so you don't have to sit and wait and watch the aeroplane for 10 minutes because it could get quite boring. So we're trundling along at 4,000 feet and if you look outside you can see we can see absolutely nothing. There's a tiny bit of sky. So just to pass the time along the way let's go and descend back down to 3,000 feet. So I'm going to move the target altitude to 3,000 feet, go to vertical speed mode, nose down at 500 feet a minute, and we're going to come off the throttle. Otherwise we will accelerate and overspeed. So you can see we were getting close to overspeeding. could descend faster if we wanted to, you just press nose down a few more times, so we're descending now at a thousand feet a minute. And you can see a magenta bar alongside the indicated airspeed ribbon. That is our rate of change of speed. It typically shows you, I think, if this is the same as the big jets, it shows you the speed you'll be doing in six seconds, but I'd have to confirm that by doing some reading. So you can see we're coming down and we can see rate of change here look as well so the altitude you'll be doing in a number of seconds time so we're just descending oh we can get some view of the ground out here this is quite good so we're getting closer to 3000 feet so the plane is slowly pulling itself out of the dive see you can see 350 feet a minute 300 feet a minute to 50 feet a minute so it's gently leveling out so we're just about to come to RBL so you can see this is the leg we are on KRDD to RBL and you'll see that switch over any moment soon to the next leg of the journey which will be RBL to KICC was it? KCIC? I can't remember now we're nearly there as we pass over this will change to reflect the next leg of the journey and we need to go for GPS mode because because we haven't it'll be quite instructive to see what happens the plane has done nothing it's gone automatically into roll mode which means it's keeping the plane level if we go to nav mode and then change the CDI to GPS there we go nav mode you can see the plane is turning left 
and because we've actually already gone past you can see that needle is ever so, so slightly to the left already so it will backtrack across the route to re-intercept which it is doing okay so the next thing we will do is line up for ILS into Chico Municipal so you can see we need a VOR frequency of 111.30 for the glide slope, or sorry, a, a nav frequency, 111.30 for the glide slope into the runway. So let's go and program that in. While we are operating in GPS mode, we don't care about programming the nav radios, they're not going to influence the navigation of the aircraft. So we want 111.30. There's something instructive here as well, so 111.30. And we switch that to become the active frequency. And you can see it's brought up an IDENT code as well for the ILS approach. So the thing we need to look at is if we... Let's put this in heading mode for the moment. So let's select the current heading and say heading mode. So the autopilot is just making us fly straight and level at the moment. So then that means we can now change the CDI over and the plane won't move around. So let's change it over to um, VOR mode or showing the localizer now. It says lock, which means it's a, a specific kind of radio frequency or radio beacon. It knows it's a localizer for ILS. The big change now, because it knows it's a localizer, is we can't change the course. The course is saying 132 degrees and come and look at this 132 degrees it's the direction of the runway or the direction of the the glide slope in this case it's not offset which means it would be an angle to the runway so we can use it to fly straight down into the runway so you could say we want to fly 132 degrees into um, into the airfield so if you imagine this line, ignore the number that's going to appear on this because I'm going to draw it backwards. But imagine we want to be on that line. If we were to enter nav mode now, the plane would turn left and intercept and fly down that all the way. But how about we want to go, measure distance from here, how about we wanted to go there? Or, or maybe if you think about it from here, measure distance from that VOR station from Red Bluff over to here so we want to actually fly 113 degrees from RBL in a straight line yeah so you would be able to do that with a VOR radio so if we were to tune back into 115.70 and say we want to fly 113 degrees you could, we could try it now so we're going to go back to 115.70 which was the it was the it's now in the standby frequency because we swapped them remember so we can swap back and we can say we want to fly 113 degrees out of there yeah so heading sorry not the heading <laughs> the course 113 so That would be 110. There's 113, look, on the course. So it, it, we're pretty much on that line, which is what you're seeing, because the wind is pushing us away from there. So let's go and try moving the heading around to see what happens to the indicator. So if we were to turn east, let's see what happens to the line. It's now saying we are to the left of the 113 degree line and we are to the left of the 113 degree line if we turn the heading back across it so let's go to say 140 degrees so the aeroplane is turning to 140 and you will see this line come back towards the middle when it's in the middle we're on top of it so yeah the plane is turning back across it now because of that 40 knot wind, even intercepting at the angle we have, look, we're going to have to intercept at a much sharper angle. 
So let's go to 160 degrees. And suddenly we're turning into the wind, look. So now you can see the needle is coming back. So when we're on when the needle is in the middle, we are on top of it. On top of the track, the 113 degree track. Into uh, sorry, away from the VOR station. Notice the line is opposite the arrow, which means it's from the VOR. So this is 113 degrees from the VOR at 115.7. So now we're on top of the track. So we could start doing this, or we could just press nav. And the plane will do it itself. Rather than us mess around with the heading, trying to guess the wind, the plane will do it itself. And it will fly the track. So it's re-intercepting, because it's gone slightly to the right of the line. And now it's going to turn right. And it will fly, it will crab itself perfectly to stay on the line. It will do a little bit of finding, le you know, weaving left and right. And there we go. So we are now basically flying down that line. And why have I just lost the engine? I think that's a control problem I've got here. So I'm just opening the engine up a bit. So you can see we're getting closer to the ILS. So we'll let it keep flying this track and then we'll switch over to the ILS when we get closer. So we're at 3000 feet, so let's go and just check something. If we go and view the information for Chico Municipal, we can see in little nav map that the elevation of the airfield is 222 feet. We're at 3000. So we probably want to be about two and a half thousand feet above the ground, so that would be about three seven, f about three seven fifty. When we get to the entrance of the ILS, if we were doing it all, you know, by the numbers, but three thousand is fine to be honest. It means we're going to come in below the glide slope, which is good because you can only really acquire the glide slope for approach if you come in from below, or well, certainly that's how it should work. If you come in from above the glide slope, the approach button shouldn't work. So what approach will do is not only fly the horizontal track, it will f follow the vertical track down the invisible line to the to the runway. We'll explain that a bit better when we get closer. Okay, so while we're just enjoying the scenery, let's go and have a look outside. And it's actually a beautiful day, isn't it? Oh, the graphics are starting to crash. This simulator's getting ready to to pack up, I think. This is the famously unstable flight simulator having a, another one of its episodes. Or it could be NVIDIA's fault, who knows. So we'll try not to pan the camera around too much while we're doing this, because we can see it's going to cause havoc. I just realised we didn't turn the taxi lights off. But we probably do want to turn the landing lights on soon because we'll be approaching. I know we're panning round, let's, let's have a look. So we can see now we've got the big old landing light on. So shall we switch over now to the VOR? So let's put this back into heading mode. So we'll make sure the heading is the direction we're actually going at the moment, and then we'll switch to heading mode. We'll change the CDI over to GPS mode. So you can see, at the moment, based on this being 115.7, it's, it's got it wrong, hasn't it? Oh, sorry, this is GPS mode. We don't want GPS mode. We want VOR mode. 
So we're going to switch the VOR over to the glide slope. So 111.3 is now programmed. So it's basically saying that we are to the right of the line, which is absolutely true. It's also saying we're flying at an angle to the line, which is also true. Yeah, so we're flying towards it. So we're flying towards that line. So that will come into the middle, hopefully at the start of the glide slope. You can also see a green diamond has appeared alongside the um, altitude ribbon. So this is our vertical placement compared to the glide slope. So at the moment, we are the, the middle of this bar. The glide slope is above us. As we get closer and we intercept, like fly through the invisible line down to the runway, this will float down towards the middle. So while the green diamond is above the halfway point, it's above us in the sky. When it goes down below, it's below us in the sky, so we are too high. So I will go to manual control on approach, so you can see these needles move around. So the CDI is in VOR mode, or, uh, but the heading is being held by the autopilot at the moment. So if I went to nav mode, you can see it now says lock, means it's following the localizer. So it is now going to intercept it itself. You can see that green diamond is coming down. So coming down towards the middle. So we're getting closer to it. As long as it doesn't get to halfway before we do it, we can actually engage approach mode. So the aeroplane will start descending all on its own when it gets to the line. So let's do that. We click approach mode and you see it says GS up here, glide slope. So we're flying along, we're going very, very fast. We're on the limit of the aircraft, really. So we're going to slow down a little bit. And you'll see the plane start to descend. So let's go and look outside while that's happening. Let's move us around. So nothing to see here at the moment. That's good, isn't it? So here comes the green diamond into the middle of the glide slope gauge and you should see it stop in the middle and the plane will start descending. In other words the plane is chasing it. There we go. The plane has started chasing the green diamond. So I'm going to go manual now so I can explain what's going on. So full manual control. Let's turn left and high. You can see the green diamond is, is dropping. We are above the glide slope. The green line has gone to the right. We are to the left of the green line of where we should be. So let's turn back across it. We are now flying back towards the horizontal position we should be. But we're not flying towards the runway. We'll be flying towards the runway when the, we're flying towards the green arrow. So we're going to turn back towards it. So now we're flying towards the runway, but we are too high. So let's cut the engine and descend. And here comes the green diamond on the altitude. It's coming back. So if you imagine looking outside, imagine the runway's out there somewhere. There's a line in the sky that's coming up past us. At the moment, we are almost in line above it. It's slightly to our right and it's below us and we're dropping down so I'm going to turn right towards it and keep falling here comes the green diamond so I'll raise the nose as we get near it and now so we're no more or less on it now look and we can keep an eye on the wind see the arrow on the wind is the wind is going to be pushing us left so we need to be turning right. So there's the airfield. We're actually going this way. So we're crabbing slightly already. <coughs> we're in 40 knot winds at the moment, but I expect they will drop off as we get closer. 
So rather than us fish around flying this all the way in, let's see if we can re-engage approach mode. Glide slope, there it goes. Now autopilot means it's not on. It is now. So the, the red flashing autopilot means I hadn't switched it on. So I had engaged approach mode, I had not turned the autopilot back on. But now it is back on. So it's re it's reacquired its position vertically and now it's going to we're not it's not following it though like we have to use nav as well. Okay. So that's my mistake. Nav handles the horizontal component of the approach. The approach button in this version of the G1000 is only the vertical component. And it hasn't acquired it. That's because we didn't come in from above, uh, from below the glide slope. Yeah? So let's disengage the autopilot and just fly it by hand. So at this point, we can see me. We can see we are above. We can see the wrong way now. But let's go and at least get the instruments agreeing with what we're doing. So we're dropping gently down. So the diamond on the altitude ribbon is about in the right place. And there we go. So we lift the nose so we don't drop as quickly. We're still descending. And mercifully, the wind is dying away as we get lower, which is what you typically expect. So this is Chico Municipal we're approaching. So at this point, it's just a case of keeping an eye on the glide slope and the heading. I mean, we can see the runway anyway. It's no big surprise. But if the weather had been a lot worse, we would have absolutely relied on those instruments to take us down to the runway. So it's not too bad, actually. In real aircraft, you have a decision height that is based both on your training and the aircraft type, about and, and what equipment is available on the aircraft about if you can't see the ground at a given altitude then you um, and given your qualifications for flying with instruments you have to make a decision on if you can land or not and that's why simulators exist so you can try situations that you are not qualified for and obviously I'm not qualified for any of this I'm not a real world pilot at all okay so we're just turning left a little bit to get back on the center line start slowing down so we can extend the flaps. You'll notice on the indicated airspeed ribbon there is a white area. That is the safe speed to deploy flaps. So we get a little bit below the glide slope so we're just raising the nose gently. You will notice the markers for the um, the glide slope on the horizontal and vertical axes will move a lot more violently the closer you are to the to the runway, and it's important you don't chase them. You have to keep in mind the direction the runway is and form a picture in your head if you can't see the runway, and don't just blindly chase them trying to keep them in the middle, because you will get wildly out of control if you start playing that game. Okay, flaps out. And we're down. Flaps up. Increase the engine to taxi and we're just going to get off the runway. And then I'll stop recording. So yeah, so that was a good example today of a short flight playing with the various autopilot modes and seeing what the G1000 could do in terms of instrumentation display. Nearly, t nearly missed the turn. Um, 
yeah, it was a good example of navigating with VORs, navigating with GPS, and playing around with the course and the heading mode, and then doing an ILS landing and following the localizer in. So I'm going to park up on this taxiway and get in everybody's way and then stop recording. So let's have a look. So put the parking brake on, have a look outside. And there's our long-suffering Cessna. And I'm going to leave it there. So I'll see you again soon. <laughs>